Sup y'all, and welcome to the Food Network, Part 3. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the second agricultural revolution by asking this essential question. What were the origins and early impacts of the second agricultural revolution? Now, the origins of the second agricultural revolution is actually quite similar to the origins of the first agricultural revolution. Both were preceded by colder global temperatures. Now, the Little Ice Age was a period of colder global temperatures beginning around 1350 and lasting till around 1850. These colder temperatures shortened growing seasons, reducing farm productivity, as well as the amount of food available per person. This stressed the human population, leading to famines, starvation, and death. Nothing very good, of course. Which in turn led to necessary innovations to provide new means of producing food for survival. This all fits perfectly with Plato's famous quote that necessity is the mother of all invention. Throughout the medieval times, prior to the Little Ice Age, a typical village was based on feudalism, consisting of three or more fields. Each villager had thin strips of land on each field that they would till. The lords, or the local landowners, rented land to the tenant farmers. In addition, there was a large plot of common land that the farmers would use for livestock grazing, fishing, or even to collect firewood. Now, two of the three main fields were planted with a different crop each year. For example, rye or wheat on one, oats or barley on a second, and the third was left fallow, or empty, to allow the soil to recover its nutrients. Animals would graze on the field, producing manure, which would fertilize the land for the next year's harvest. Each year, a different field would be left fallow. And these tenant farmers, or peasants, were also subsistence farmers, growing just enough food to survive and sell any surplus at the market for a meager profit. This system largely prevailed unchanged for centuries, until the Little Ice Age hit, and especially during the coldest period during the 1600s. This basic map shows how the different plots of land would have been divided amongst the farmers. Now because more food had been grown during the medieval warm period, an era of modest population growth occurred, and with the cooler temperatures arriving especially in the 1600s, the open field system proved to be inefficient. With less food per person, a higher demand for more food resulted, as well as higher food prices. Now in England, Parliament passed acts that allowed landlords to combine and fence off the common land, ending the ancient feudal system of peasants using that land for farming, fishing, or collecting firewood, for example. Now, these laws have been passed since the 12th century, but increased dramatically in the 18th century. Actually, several wealthier peasants supported this since they could sometimes rent the land and make more profit themselves. Landlords earned greater profits due to increased efficiency, for example, through the production of more wool or even more grains. New techniques could also be experimented with, and peasants were often given other land as compensation, although often of less quality and extent. Several farmers and landowners experimented with different crops, applying the ideas and methods promoted through the scientific revolution. The enclosure movement made farming more efficient, which meant fewer peasants were needed to farm. As a result, many migrated to the cities, where cheap labor was in ever-creasing demand. Now, moving away from the medieval three-field rotation system, a four-field rotation was pioneered by farmers, namely around Flanders, in Belgium. This was developed in the early 16th century and later popularized by the British agriculturalist Charles Turnip Townsend in the 18th century. His system rotated the usual crops, such as wheat and barley. Now, since the roots of the turnips were deeper, they didn't necessarily use the same nutrients in the soil. But more importantly, however, this system opened up a fodder crop, or animal crop, allowing livestock to be bred year-round. This was due to clover, that would reintroduce nitrates into the soil, preventing the field from having to be left fallow. This system of crop rotation, where land is usually not left fallow, persists to this day. And we can thank the Little Ice Age for making this all possible. This image shows an aerial view of an agricultural region in the state of Kansas. You'll notice several circles across the cultural landscape. Now, of course, these aren't alien-made crop circles. Today, most modern farming utilizes a central pivot irrigation system, 
in which equipment rotates around a pivot and crops are watered with sprinklers, usually with an electrically powered automated system. In the image you see here, the dark circles are corn, the light green are sorghum, now these grains are usually used for animal fodder, the golden circles are wheat, and some plots are left fallow due to a lack of demand or are just left plowed but unseeded. And we can also see the impact of agriculture in countries away from the United States, such as the Wadi as Sirin Basin in Saudi Arabia. Now, since the late 1980s, Saudi Arabia has been drilling for a resource more precious than oil. Engineers and farmers have tapped hidden reserves of water to grow grains, fruits, and vegetables in the desert. The series of false color images you will see showcase the evolution of agricultural operations in Saudi Arabia, as viewed by satellites. The thirsty plants that rise out of the Arabian desert are quenched by water that dates back to the last interglaciation, in a more temperate past about 20,000 years ago. This fossil water filled aquifers, or porous water-holding rocks, that are now buried deep under the sand seas and limestone formations. Saudi Arabia has reached this underground water source by drilling wells through the sedimentary rock as much as a kilometer beneath the desert sands. Although no one knows how much water lies beneath the desert, hydrologists believe it will only be economical to pump it for about 50 more years. But certainly you can see how modern irrigation and agriculture has truly changed the landscape of the world. Now, another innovation that revolutionized agriculture was the seed drill that was improved on and perfected in 1701 by Jethro Tull. No, not that one. This guy. Jethro Tull helped to make it possible to sow seeds in neat rows, making the germination of the seeds more likely and also enabling farmers to more easily tend and to cultivate their crops. Bear in mind, the seed drill was not all that new, but once it made its way to Britain especially, the second agricultural revolution really took off. Tull's methods were adopted by many large landowners, and they truly helped form the basis of modern agriculture. Just travel, for example, to Napa Valley in California, that is wine country, mainly because that crop is worth more than, say, figs or dates or other Mediterranean-type crops. These agriculturalists have brought the cultivation of grapes literally down to a science, producing them in exactly the right amounts with the right distance between each row and each vine. And Europe wasn't the only region to massively further the production of food. The United States, with its relatively cheap and vast farmlands, as well as its free society, provided the right environment for innovation. One example was the cotton gin, invented by Eli Whitney, around 1793. This machine quickly and easily separates the cotton fibers from the seeds, a job previously done by hand. These seeds are used again to grow more cotton, and this simple machine, massively duplicated, led to an immense increase in cotton production as well, unfortunately, as well as a massive expansion of slavery in the United States South. You see, the machine replaced the demand for slaves to pick out the seeds, but actually increased the demand for slaves to pick the cotton to feed the machines. Another remarkable machine was the horse-drawn mechanical reaper, invented by Cyrus McCormick in 1830. This enabled farmers to harvest more wheat in less time. By using a series of rotating motions, he was able to cut grain much more efficiently. A large spinning wheel brought the grain to a cutting blade and acted like a pair of scissors. The cut grain would go into a compartment at the back of the machine. And in 1835, John Deere invented the steel plow. This allowed farmers to easily plow the new prairie soils as the country moved westward, fulfilling America's dream of manifest destiny, expanding from sea to shining sea. Lighter than the iron plow, Deere's steel plow was much more efficient, as horses could be used. Oxen were slow but strong, horses were faster. Now, since there are a few trees in the Great Plains to build wood fences, a solution was sought after with a great deal of money waiting for anyone who could solve the problem. And in 1874, Joseph Glidden devised an efficient means of producing barbed wire. This allowed the settlers to stay in the drier western plain states. They had access to water, they kept their livestock on land, and kept them from wandering off. Of course, 
The modern versions of these inventions are much improved, but they are still based on the sophisticated innovations of motivated individuals driven by the realities of a changing world. Chocolate or the moose? <laughs> <laughs>